Okay. Last week in our classes, we did just a very simple Hello World application. And our program consisted of just one class. Um, you're never going to see that again. <laughs> all right, so I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, all the programs that we're going to do from here on in, and any program that you consider is going to have multiple classes in it. Um, there will always be at least one class that is sort of the boss. All right, what do I mean by the boss? I mean it sort of runs the show. It does, and it brings everything together. Now, in larger applications, that's liable to be a graphical user interface, a more complete applications. And we'll talk about graphical user interfaces you know, towards the end of the semester. But for now, we're going to have a class that's called a unit test class. It's sort of the boss. And by unit test, what we mean is it's going to test, we're going to use it to test to make sure our other classes work correctly. All right? Um, and so the unit test job will be to ask the other classes to do things. We can look at the results and make sure the results are right. That way we know that the other classes we created are correct. All right? So many of you have had at least CISS 160. Can anyone define class and or object to me. What is a class? What is an object? Anyone want to take a stab? Okay. Well, we're here to learn, right? I don't necessarily expect you to have a good definition of it, but We'll work on it together. A class is meant to be a template. A class is meant to encapsulate, and encapsulate is a word that's used often in object-oriented programming, such as Java. About something. So a class encapsulates the object, uh, the logic about something. All right? That's what we mean by class. Another way to say that is that everything about that thing is going to be contained in the class. All right? So you're not going to have Let's say if we take it as an example, a student class. When I say something, I mean some sort of entity, probably a person, place, or thing, right? So if I talked about a student class, everything about students would be contained in that class. Let me rephrase that just a teeny bit. Everything that was relevant about students to our particular system would be encapsulated, would be contained in that class. So if you think about students, what are some things that you can do about student, do with students? And what are some characteristics that students have? Because when I say a class encapsulates the logic, I'll just put et cetera for now, et cetera. I mean that classes encapsulate, contain logic, calculations, processes, and they also contain characteristics. So let's take, for example, a student. What are some characteristics that all students have? They all have a student ID, right? They all have a first name. They all have a last name, all right? They all have an address, city, state, and zip. All right? Those are attributes. Those are characteristics. And the code for that is going to live inside the student class. All right? It's not going to be a little bit of it here, a little bit of it there. It's all going to be within the one class. 
So attributes or characteristics are one thing that a student has, and that would be one thing that is contained within a student class. The other thing, though, are some processes or some activities that a student can do. A student, for example, uh, pays tuition. Right? A student has a tuition amount that's due. And a student can make payments for that tuition. A student can enroll in a class. A student can get a grade in a class. A student can graduate and so on. These are all actions or activities that a student can perform. So those are the two sorts of things that we're going to have in a class. We're going to have attributes or characteristics, and then we're going to have methods, things that that entity can do. For example, calculate tuition. That's something that a student has. A student has a tuition amount that's due. So being able to calculate the student's tuition would be a function or a method that would exist in a student class. Okay? We're going to make a pizza class. And we're going to make a, a simple pizza class with some properties, some methods, and we're going to look at that. And I think the best way to do this is to dive in. All right? We're going to look at the pizza class. Then we're going to look at the unit test class, and we're going to try to make some sense and make sure that we understand what's contained in a class, what an object is, and how our boss class, which is our unit test class, the class that sort of runs the show, connects with the other classes in our program. So we're going to do that. So what I have, I have uploaded to Canvas. I have here a unit test class, and I have a pizza class. Let's start with the pizza class. All right. For the most part, our classes are going to be public. All right. If I ever slip up and use the word always, or never, or something like that, Realize that there's probably exceptions to everything. So I might say all our classes are going to be public. That might not necessarily be true. There might be some that are something else. But at least for now, they're all going to be public. What that means when we say it's public, it means that other classes can use this class. Other classes can contain this class. And we know that because we made it public. All right, so a class starts, and we reviewed this last week. I just want to mention it again. We'll have the word public in most cases. It could have some other things, but typically it's going to be public. The word class that indicates it's a class. The name of the class, and then these curly braces that go around everything that's contained in the class from beginning to end. And the nice thing about Notepad++ and other editors is that we can see that this brace belongs to that brace. So they match up right. For every one of these left braces, there needs to be a matching right brace. All right? If we don't have that, then we have a problem. Because if I put my mouse behind this, there's not another one it matches up with and there'll be a problem. Likewise, if we have an extra, we'll be able to visually determine that we have an extra one. OK, so public class and the name of the class. Names of classes should be capitalized. All right? And name of the file in which we store the class in should be the name of the class dot Java. So this class is pizza. All right. It is stored in a file called pizza.java. For at least now, there's going to be one class per source file. So we have a 
class called pizza is going to be in pizza Java. We have a unit test class that's going to be in unit test.java. Now, what do we have? We mentioned what do we have about a class? We have two things about a class. We have attributes. That's what these are. Usually you put them at the very top of the class. <coughs> Put comments by the double slashes. Just as classes can be public or private or whatever, attributes can be public or private or a third thing that we'll talk about later on in the course. For the most part, we're going to make all our attributes private. All right? And we do this for a good reason. By making it private, that means that other classes' codes can't directly access these attributes. So we have three attributes, a string for size, in other words, small, medium, or large, a string for the kind of crust, thick or thin, and a Boolean for whether it has pepperoni or not. A Boolean, again, is a variable that's either set to true or false. All right? That's what a Boolean is. Now, we made those private. What does that mean? That means that other classes can't directly go and manipulate those attributes. OK? How do other classes then talk to those attributes? If we make a pizza and we want to show that that pizza has pepperoni on it, how can we do that if we can't set this has pepperoni or attribute to true? Well, we can't directly set it true, but we could use a method or a function to do that. And that's this public void set pepper has pepperoni does. Functions are typically, for the most part, going to be public. Attributes are going to be private. And you will use the, uh, the, the method to set the attribute. So if I have code somewhere that wants to make a pepperoni, or make a piece that have pepperoni on it, I can't say has pepperoni equals true. I can't use the set as pepperoni method and pass it a true. OK? This is largely to ensure the integrity of the data. Later on, and again, this is, this is one of those things you kind of have to trust me about because we're not going to do it today. But later on, we're going to put validation in here to make sure that a pizza, the size of the pizza, could only be small, medium, or large. If we let someone directly manipulate that pizza attribute, Someone could set it to something goofy, like really big, or tiny, or whatever. All right, That wouldn't make sense to the rest of our class. So we're going to limit how people can use those attributes. And we limit that by forcing them to use the functions to set those attributes. So you can directly access the attribute of has pepperoni or size, or crust. You can only access it through the methods. So notice we have three, we have three methods that, are, that start with the word set. And these are the methods that we use to manipulate those attributes. Likewise, because these attributes are private, we can't, another class can't x-ray in and see the values of these. We have what have to use the get methods to get the uh, appropriate attributes. So we're going to we have three attributes. They're all private. We have three get methods 
and three gap methods. Notice a couple things. All the attribute names start with lowercase letters, but each subsequent word is capitalized. So has pepperoni, the H in has is lowercase, the P in pepperoni is uppercase. And action names or method names are the same way. Set size. Set starts with a lowercase s. Size starts with an uppercase s. Notice for all the sets, they're void. What does it mean when we say a function's void? Does it return anything? So the way you read this is this indicates whether the function is public or private. This indicates what the function returns. This indicates the name of the function. And this indicates the arguments. So in this case, this method doesn't return anything but accepts a string argument. Notice, and it makes sense, that whatever type string is, whatever type size is, that's going to be the argument that we pass to this function. Because we're going to take that argument and set size attribute to whatever we call that function with. Likewise with crust. Crust is also a string. So the set method is void. The argument is going to be one argument and it's going to be a string and we simply take that argument and assign it to the variable crust. And with, with the boolean, the argument is boolean which matches that returns nothing, and we set the boolean for whether it has pepperoni with the value of the argument. Now the get methods are the opposite. The get methods don't have any arguments, and the revert return value matches the return value of the attribute. So size and crust are strings, so these methods return the size attribute, so they return a string. Pepperoni is a Boolean, so we're returning a Boolean, which is the has pepperoni Boolean. So for each attribute, we're going to have a get and set. All right? And the sets return nothing except an argument that matches the data type of the attribute. The gets return something that matches the data type of the, of the attribute and accepts no arguments. We can have functions too that I do calculations based on the attributes. One of the functions that we have here is to calculate the bake time. Okay? And in this case what I've defined is that thin crusts, no matter what size they are, small, medium, or large, take 10 minutes to bake, whereas the bake time for thick crust is 16 minutes. Okay? So this function doesn't accept any arguments. It returns a double, which is the bake time. The bake time is determined by looking at the value of the crust. If the crust is thin, then the bake time is 10 minutes. Otherwise, the bake time is 16 minutes. And in either case, we return the bake time. Now, notice that this if statement looks a lot like the if statement in C sharp. We have the word if. We have a condition. And then we have a true branch of the if statement and a false branch of the if statement. Notice this is, this is how we compare strings. We don't use the two equal signs to compare strings. We say if this string, which is crust, dot equals thin, that will be checking to see if this pizza is a thin crust pizza or not, then a bake time equals 10, other time the bake time equals 16. Finally, we return the bake time. All right? Questions about this? 
We have a class that has attributes. We make those attributes private. That is called data hiding, to make the attributes private. From a theoretical perspective, other classes don't need to know what's going on, what attributes the pizza is storing. All they need to know is what functions are available. So we make those private, and we make the functions public. So the public functions are how we either assign a value to an attribute or get the value from an attribute. And then finally, we have functions that do calculations and other stuff. All right, let's look at our test class. Our test class is going to test the bake time for these things. All right. So let's look at what we're doing here. We have two different test cases, right? Because we notice that the bake time of a pizza depends on whether it's thick or thin crust. So to really test this, we would test a thin crust pizza and a thick crust pizza and make sure we get the right answers. It's important that you thoroughly test your code. All right? I'm calling this a unit test because I may be the person in charge of writing the pizza class. We may be writing a system for uh, an Italian restaurant that makes pizzas and salads and sandwiches and all those things, and we may each be assigned a particular class to write. Well, before I turn my class in to be part of the bigger system, I want to make sure that it does the job that it's supposed to do. All right? So I want to test my piece of the puzzle. That's what's known as a unit test, where I, te where I test the part of the project that I'm working on. When everyone is all done and we put everything together into a system, that would be what is called a system test. That way we test to make sure that the GUI that someone wrote works with my pizza class and gives the correct results. All right? So at this point, we have our pizza class. This pizza class contains everything that's important, at least right now, about a pizza that we need to be included in our system. Now, obviously, this is not everything you need to know about a pizza, right? We haven't calculated the cost of the pizza. All right, but that'll come. Right now, this contains everything we need right now. We will expand it. All right, so this is meant to be a template, a description of what we're going to store about any pizza we have. Any pizza we have, we have the size of it, the crust, and whether it has pepperoni or not. All right, and we'll be able to set those attributes, we'll be able to get those attributes, and we'll be able to calculate the bake time. That now is all we're demanding from our pizza class, that we can do those handful of things. Again, in a more realistic system, there'd be a lot more stuff we could do. But this is all we care about right now. So this is meant to be a template that represents all pizzas that we may make at our pizza shop. Just like we could define a student class that's meant to, to define every student at our institution. And it would add everything that a student could do. All the attributes that a student could have, all the methods that a student could have. Now, that's a template. That's a class. It represents all instances of a particular kind of thing. Now, in this room, however, there are what? Maybe a dozen individual students. All right? I could define one class to represent all of you, all the characteristics that were relevant for a school, your name, your student number, and so on down the line, along with a variety of methods that I would need. But I'm going to create individual students from that template. 
Just like I'm going to create individual pizzas from my class of pizza or from my template of pizza. All right? And I'm going to keep track of them. Eventually, you know, I'm going to add them to an order. And I'm going to look and I'm going to see what the price of the order is. I'm going to look to see how long it's going to take for the, all the pizzas to bake and so on. Okay. That's what we're doing here. We're going to make two instances of our pizza class. These instances are called objects. The class represents all the members of the group. It's a template for all the members of the group. An object represents one member of that group. So in this example, P1 and P2 are two pizza objects. They're meant to represent two specific pizzas. Maybe the pizzas that I'm making right now for to fill an order. So, let's see what we do. I have this statement to create a new pizza object. What that says is, I have a new pizza object. That's the type of object it's going to be. Its name is P1. Where am I getting a new pizza object from? I'm creating it from scratch, more or less. All right, there's other ways to get an object. But this way, I'm calling what is called the constructor for the pizza object. Now, we didn't see anything. There are no constructors in the pizza class. We'll study constructors probably sometime next week. But just know that if you don't make a constructor, one is automatically generated. All right? So this line creates a variable called P1. That variable can store pizzas in it, all right? Strictly speaking, for those of you that may have studied this a little bit before, it can store a pointer to a pizza. But we'll review that in more detail later. P1 can store a pizza or a pointer to a pizza. Where did that pizza come from? It's a brand new pizza that we're making right now using the default constructor. What this statement does here, this half of the statement, is it allocates the memory for that pizza object. It, it creates that object in memory and allocates a certain amount of memory for that pizza object. And this part of the statement says that P1 is the variable that we're going to use to point to that pizza that we just made in memory. So, at 7, we have a pizza, brand new pizza that we've just created. All right? Now, none of these properties are set yet. We created it as a sort of an empty object. That's what these lines of code do. We're setting those attributes. The first line says, set the size to L. So I'm calling the set size method on this pizza object. Where do we see what that method looks like? Well, this is a P1's a pizza object, so the set size method is going to live in the pizza class. That's going to take whatever argument we give it, in our case L, and it's going to store it in the size attribute of the pizza. Same thing with thin, same thing with pepperoni. Let's draw a picture of what's happening here. All right, what's happening memory? I have this statement.
I execute the statement that says P pizza P1 equals new pizza. What that will do is that will create in memory a pizza object. What is part of the pizza object? The pizza object has three actions, size, crust, and half pepperoni. So this pizza lives in memory somewhere. variables is not initialized yet because we simply created a brand new pizza object from scratch. We also have all the functions, all the methods in this object. So we, that's this line. In memory, we have essentially a blank pizza. And what do we have for a blank pizza? Well, we have these three properties. They have no values. And we have all those methods. So we come along to this statement and say P1 set size L. OK? What is that saying to do? That is saying, on the pizza object that we have named P1, call the method called setSize and pass it an argument of 1. I'm sorry, not 1, L. All right. So we call on this object. Remember, all the methods are here, too. We call setSize, the setSize method, and we give it an argument of L. What does that do? Well, the method says, take that argument. Remember, whatever's in here gets passed to here as an argument. So that value L gets put in this variable arg. We take that arg, and we assign it to the variable size inside the pizza object. So after this statement, we call the set size method on this object that we create. This is P1. We give it the argument of L. We take that argument and assign it to the variable size. So size has a value of L. See, we can access those attributes. We just have to use the method to do so. We can't do something like this. We can't say P1 size equals L. All right? Why can't we do that? We can't do that because we said size was private. Therefore, another class can't access it. Now, we do the same thing for set crust and set pepperoni. We give this a value of thin, we give this a value of false, and we end up setting the crust as being thin and has pepperoni as false. We then call the method p1 calc bake time, and that should return a value of, because it's thin, Right? Should return a value of 10 for the bake time. Now, we then this string of statements. And this does the same thing, except it creates a new pizza object from scratch, and it gives it the name of P2. So we now have. A pizza called P2 is a pizza. It has a crust, and whether or not it has any, and all its methods. 
we assign L to the size of pizza, thick to the crust, and false to pepperoni. Then we call the, so that's what P2 looks like. We call the calculate bake time method because it's thick, it's going to return a value of 16 for the bake time. Now let's go and compile this and run it and make sure that I'm not lying to you. So how do I compile? I'm going to go to the command line, command prompt. I'm going to go to that directory. I'm in the LCCC lab user directory. I'm going to go to desktop. And then I'm going to go to pizza update. Here's a trick. You can say pizza star and it'll take you to the directory pizza update, assuming there's only one of those. I do a dir to see that. I compile this by typing in Java C star dot Java. That will compile anything that ends in a Java. No news is good news. It compiled. Didn't give me any errors. That means it compiled correctly. I can now run it. And I should see that the bake time of the first pizza is 10 minutes. The bake time of the second pizza is 16 minutes. And sure enough, that's what I get. All right. Questions about this? Now let's play around with this and let's make some mistakes. I'm going to make a mistake here. I'm going to say P1 size equals L. All right. That should, you might think that that should work because P1 is a pizza object and it has a size associated with it. But when I go to compile, I get an error saying that size has private access. So that, that's what I can't do by making that private. If it were public, I'd be able to do that. But we've already established that making it public is a bad idea because we want control. We want to force users to use, people that are using our code, to use the appropriate method and not be able to address that directly. Questions about this? Yes? Yes. Yeah, capitalize the name of the attribute. Yes. Right. Can I do either? What do you mean? Well, remember, the equal sign is two different things in C sharp. All right? Or in C sharp and in Java. A single equal means assignment. That's where you say this equals that. So take that and do equals. The equals equals is used for comparison. And you can use the equals equals if you are comparing what are called primitives together. Primitives are ints, doubles, booleans, things like that. So you can use the equal equal if you're comparing primitives. If you're comparing strings, though, 
strings are actually objects. So you can't compare objects using the equals equals is probably the full way that I should have said it. All right. Other questions about this? Let's see. Could we do a third pizza? Certainly. P3 equals new pizza. We're going to create a new pizza. We could set the crust or set the size to small. Set this equal to thin. Set this equal to true. Now remember, if I want to change the third pizza, I have to say P3 here because that's the name of the third pizza. And then it will do that. Every time you see a new command here, I'm making a new pizza. And the variable on the left-hand side of it is the name that we're using to store that pizza. And the, the name before the name of the function is the pizza that I'm setting the value to. So P3 set size sets the size for the third pizza. Doesn't do anything for the size of the second pizza or the one first pizza. So this should also be 10 minutes because it's a thin pizza. And sure enough, it's 10. Now, what if I wanted to get what if I wanted to print the size of the first pizza? I'm going to say first pizza size is Pardon me? Okay, so the first piece of variable is what? P1? And then what? That would be get size. Because remember, getters and setters, the gets return the value of a property. The set allows you to change the value of the property. And we could do the same thing for the pizza crust. And then finally, whether it has pepperoni or not. Wow, that didn't go good. Anyone see what I did wrong? Part no? This is the plus sign. So if we look here, this should be a plus. And notice what the error says. It's confusing. It says it expected a bracket there. Well, it expected a bracket there because without a plus sign, it thinks that that's the end. So I really want a plus sign there, here, 
and here. So the first one is large, thin, does have pepperoni, and the bake time is 10 minutes for it. Okay, what we're going to do next time is we're going to write some more functions on this guy. Uh, because obviously we're going to want to know how much a pizza costs. So we're going to define some rules of how they charge for pizzas at this pizzeria. And we're going to write a calculate cost of the pizza function. All right, so you might want to think about how that will be. Um, we'll come up with some rules, and then we'll, we'll go and do that. All right, that's all I had today. Uh, we'll see you up in lab. One thing, though, remember how the grading in this class works, because I think there's some confusion. I just want to review it. This is a new process. What you do is this. Upload to Canvas your completed solution. Then, see me in lab. In fact, I'll probably go around today in lab, seeing who has uploaded it and who hasn't. And if I haven't already graded it uh, for you, I'll go in and grade your assignment with you there so that you can see. So. Upload the canvas prior to coming to lab. If you haven't done that yet, that's fine. You can do it now. But upload the canvas, and then make sure I see you in lab so I can grade the assignment with you there and get your grade entered. All right, we'll see you up in lab.